everyone. So today I decided to do sort of a snap video on MR safety. I feel like it's important for a medical physicist to know, you know, what are um, certain precautions that need to take place, uh, what things that you should be aware of, etc. Um, so yeah, so today um, my, the title of this talk is MRI safety and my name is Christian and I am a diagnostic medical physics resident at Boston Children's Hospital. So these cases may be rare, you know, um, you might have a patient that needs an MR scan. Uh, I mean, they might be rare, but it's good to know that they can still occur. So this happened at the Brigham and Women's uh, Hospital. Basically, the man was on a gurney and, uh, you know, he was being wheeled into the room somewhat and then they realized that the gurney was being pulled towards the MR machine and uh, the man was still on it. So they got him off, but they couldn't like hold the gurney back um, and it flew right into the scanner. So if I can just read for a moment, uh, the MRI scan had gone smoothly, the huge machine searching for clues for, to Paul Doherty's excruciating back pain, but the technician who then moved Doherty onto a gurney in the hallway inadvertently wheeled him back into the MRI room doing what should never be done, bringing a metal object into a space radiating with magnetic power. The MRI's magnet began to drag the bed toward it, with Doherty uh, still on it. The employee shouted for help and two colleagues rushed in. They immediately realized that even the three of them were not strong enough to combat an MRI. They helped Doherty off and let the bed go. Now out in the hallway, they heard a, a crunchy metallic noise, something like a car crash. The gurney had smashed into the magnetic resonant imaging machine where it would stay for the next three days. So luckily no one was injured in this accident. Um, this was at Brigham and Women's Hospital here in Boston. Uh, but the, ac the incident highlights the hazards of a technology with risks uh, that are uh, becoming more widely appreciated. Um, MRIs have always been considered to be a safer and require less regulation than x-rays or CT scans which emit ionizing radiation that can potentially cause cancer. But MRIs can turn common metal objects like hammers, oxygen tanks, and floor polishers into projectiles. So oxygen tanks, that leads us to this story here. Uh, this is about a, a small boy, he was six, he's six years old, um, he dies of a skull injury uh, during an MRI scan. So there was an oxygen tank in the room and that just hurled towards him and it crushed his skull. Um, so if I can read again, um, this is from the New York Times. Uh, outside of the x-ray, perhaps no other medical examination is as well known or as safe as the magnetic resonant imaging test, which is conducted 8 million times a year in the United States on patients ranging from people people with brain tumors to famous athletes with knee injuries. But today, officials at the Westchester Medical Center announced that something went horribly wrong on Friday with an MRI test on a boy, six, who had just undergone surgery. Even though no metal objects were are uh, supposed to be in the testing area because they will be pulled toward the 10-ton machine by its powerful electromagnet, a metal oxygen tank somehow made it into the examination room. The tank, about the size of a fire extinguisher, became magnetized, then flew through the air at 20 to 30 feet per second and fractured the boy's skull. So the boy died on Sunday, um, this was back in 2001, and on that day an, an autopsy uh, conducted by the Westchester County Medical Examiner's Office confirmed that he had died of blunt force trauma, severe hemorrhaging, and a contusion to the brain. Conditions like um, when you hit the, the vessels. So the hospital and the State Department of Health are investigating and the Westchester District Attorney's Office is also reviewing the case. So it goes without saying that, you know, even though these cases are a little bit rare, it's a huge responsibility to manage an MRI machine. And as you can see here, this is what it looks like, you know, to have a gurney that uh, flies into the machine and it just kind of stays there until you ramp down the magnet. Um, same can happen with a wheelchair.
this is a wheelchair and it has flown right into the machine. Um, so that's the other thing you have to, to, you know, keep in mind is if you're wheeling someone into the room, um, you can't do that because it will get magnetized and, and fly right into the machine. So no putting this up to right next to the machine itself. Um, and it's not just that objects fly into the machine, you can also get, you know, the patient can get burns if you have, uh, if they have something ferromagnetic on them while they're in the machine. Uh, this is why some people actually, um, uh, maybe most people, oppose sedating the patient when they're uh, being imaged in an MR uh, because of the fact that they might have something ferromagnetic on them. And if they're sedated, they can't actually, you know, they can't squeeze that little, uh, they, they can't alert the, the tech uh, to come in at all. So. Um, this is something just to keep in mind, uh, you know, if you are going to sedate a patient, make sure that they actually have n no ferromagnetic object on them at all. Um, so just before I go into all the safety stuff, I want to go into the system overview, just, you know, just so people know what I'm talking about. Um, so you have the magnet room, you have the equipment room, and then you have the control room. So the magnet room, you know, that's exactly where the magnet is. You have the equipment room, which is sort of like... The equipment room, there's equipment that is sort of outside of the um, MR itself and some of it is kind of like in the, the room that's a, uh, adjacent to it. And then you have the control room, uh, which is basically, you know, uh, it's just where you watch the patient being scanned. It's typically where it detects it. And a medical physicist, if they're doing like an ACR scan. So this is the magnet room itself. Um, you can see here, number one is the power injector. It's like if you have gadolinium, uh, something like that, and you want to in inject a contrast agent into the patient. Um, you've got a table here, a uh, table that you put the patient on. And then you have a cart with coils. So this cart is not magnetized, but it's got coils on it because there's different types of coils for different body parts. Um, and they're very interesting. And I do test, uh, I do test coils. Um, I do know how to do them, both for GE and for Siemens. Um, so the magnet room contains the MR magnet itself, uh, its shell and its enclosure, uh, the support footings and also the patient table. Um, there's cables, vents, wiring uh, that's usually uh, that usually enters on top of the magnet uh, assembly and it's passed along a tray in the ceiling. There's some wires and tubing that may pass uh, from below along trenches in the floor. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, the walls are constructed in layers and perform several independent functions, so magnetic shielding to confine the fringe field, acoustic shielding to restrict noise transmission to the control room and beyond, and RF shielding to prevent magnetic electromagnetic noise from entering or leaving the room. Um, so typically, uh, the weight of a 1.5 Tesla cylindrical superconducting scanner is on the order of 10,000 pounds or 4,500 kilos while the 3T scanner can weigh 17,000 pounds, or 7,500 kilograms. It's also good to keep in mind that you have the fringe fields and you have to kind of understand their behavior, um, you know, to know how far you can actually step into the room. Because there is a point where, um, and I would never advise this, but you can get away with, you know, certain objects right outside the 1G field. Um, of course, I, I'm more conservative than that. I just would say take everything out of your pocket before you go in. Uh, but the fringe fields, you can kind of see here um, the shape. Um, so the fringe field is the peripheral magnetic field outside of the magnet, magnet core. Uh, depending on the design of the magnet and room, a uh, moderately large fringe field can, ex can extend several meters around, above, and below an MR scanner. Um, the field plots are available from each magnet manufacturer, so they'll they'll give that to you. Uh, for cylindrical superconducting scanners, the fringe fields are largest along the direction of the axis bore, so along the set axis or the um, the same axis as the main magnetic field. Uh, the strength of a magnet fringe field is inversely proportional to the third power of the distance, so 1 over r cubed. So that's different than the 1 over r squared, and that's from uh, the magnet isocenter. So moving twice as far away from the magnet, the fringe field should fall by a factor of approximately, you know, 1 to the 
to the power of, uh, sorry, uh, 1 over 2 to the power of, and because older pacemakers may be affected by magnetic fields exceeding 5 gauss or 0 0.5 millitesla, the US FDA established guidelines to protect the unsuspecting public from exposure to fields of 5G or higher. So smaller fields like 1 to 3G can affect nearby CT and MR scanners, and fringe fields that are 10G may affect the computers. 30G may magnetize your watch and erase your credit card. So, you know, if you're getting into uh, this field here, like 10G, this will affect your computers. If you go a little bit further, the, that will erase your, uh, your credit card and magnetize your watch. Um, just to look at the equipment room, um, this is not super interesting, uh, but it's good to know. Um, so this is the gradient or RF cabinet. Uh, this right here is the power supply. We have the chiller here and the helium pump. So over here, um, the black vertical oriented hoses contain coolant that is circulated to remove the considerable heat generated by these amplifiers. And then over here you have the array processor where numerical processing of MR data, um, including the Fourier transform, takes place. And then here you have uh, the entire schematic of a cooling system, um, and this is provided by uh, GE Healthcare. So you have your power gradient RF cabinet here, you have your heat exchanger here, your cryo cooler compressor, and then you have your, your gradient coils and your, your magnetic coils, your, your main magnetic field here. Um, and, um, yeah, so this is just an MR system water cooling block diagram, sort of like the auxiliary, more of the auxiliary system. Uh, this is what the helium pump actually looks like. Uh, this is what the chiller looks like. And these are the outside chillers, so these that you see outside here are just kind of like the, the outside components. And then of course you have the control room, so this is immediately outside the magnet room. Um, it contains the operator console, keyboard, commu communication devices, EKG and oxygen monitors, and computer equipment that controls the scanner. Um, so that's the box on the, on the floor at the lower right of the desk there. So just to go over some basic hardware too, um, you know, this is the giant superconducting magnet that produces the homogeneous mag field, the B naught field. Um, it's about, it's greater than 10,000 times the Earth's magnetic field, and it is always on. So any items with iron or ferromagnetic properties can get sucked into the magnet. This is the gradient coil. Um, so this just alters the uh, main magnetic field in the X, Y, and Z direction, so it localizes the RF signal in space. I do an entire video uh, where I talk about how the MR signal is localized, so check that video out. Um, and this is what the coils actually look like, so weird shape here. Um, and then I have the RF coils, so this is send receive RF signals uh, to and from tissue. And this is what the RF coils actually look like. So they're not that pretty, but you know they, they do a good job. Actually, the ones from Siemens, like you know, a lot of them are are actually nice looking. Um, so the magnet, the magnet uh, here, like the B naught field, is static and homogeneous and on the order of Tesla. Uh, the gradient coils are spatially varying and they're on the order of uh, millitesla per meter. And then you have the RF coils, which are temporarily varying, and they're on the order of microtesla. So just to go over the some of these components, so um, there's always a static magnetic field, be not, we know that. And that's going in this direction here. Um, and then you have a field strength that falls off with distance. So you know the coils, they have a current and they're flowing through them. So we expect, we expect a continuous gradual fall off with B0 and it just kind of falls off in, in every direction. Um, and then there's also safety issues with medical devices within the main magnetic field strength that is greater than 5 gauss. So cording off magnetic field that exceeds 5 gauss is, is needed. Um, so the 1.5 and 3T scanners have fields that extend far away, which makes sense. Um, so the manufacturers develop these active shields. So these active shields, um, which are over here, 
uh, the blocks that I've drawn, drawn outside here. You have them. Um, so this is uh, there's an extra magnetic field outside of a magnet oriented in the opposite direction. So they have a magnetic field going in the opposite direction. So they either cancel or truncate that main magnetic field, however you want to think about it. Truncate's probably a better word. Um, and the 3T scanner can be installed, therefore, in a smaller room with these active shields. Um, and these shield magnets have a field that drops to zero pretty rapidly. So this it drops to zero pretty rapidly. Um, so one can get remarkably close uh, holding a tire iron in your hand. Of course, I don't recommend that, but um, you know, it just goes to show that, I mean, this magnetic field is pretty strong, so you do need active shielding. Um, otherwise, you'd have to have a bigger room. That would be the solution to this. Um, so your main mag so the mag field slope, the magnetic field slope is extremely steep. As soon as you get close to the magnet itself, I mean, you saw the fringe fields, the slope of that, that change in the magnetization is going to be quite steep. So if an object like this uh, blue one here that I've drawn gets close, um, it'll attach itself to the machine. And you've seen that, you know, with images I've shown of the gurney and the wheelchair that have been attached to the machine. Um, if you try to pull it away from the contact surface, it will try to align with the magnetic field. It's actually trying to do that anyway. Um, so there will be some sort of torque. Um, it'll torque its way into alignment with the uh, main magnetic field with a lot of force. Um, so it'll torque to a point where your body is between the object and the scanner. And I heard a story once of a guy who actually tried to pull something off of that scanner and he basically, you know, got to a point where it was, his, it, he had his elbow between the the object and the machine. So he ended up, you know, needing, I don't know how many stitches he had, but he had to, his, his elbow got fractured basically and he had to get it, uh, he had to get surgery for it. So don't try to do that yourself. Um, typically they have trained service people that will, will remove these objects. Um, what they'll do is they'll actually come in and ramp down the main magnetic field so you can just pull it off. Um, it does, you know, there's cost to it though, so that's something you have to be aware of too. Um, it, they're highly specialized people uh, that actually come in and do this, so uh, that's one thing to be aware of, which is why we do take um, safety, these types of, of safety precautions. Um, and this here, you know, this is an example of a janitor's uh, buffer that got basically, I guess he wasn't paying attention and he basically tried to, uh, he was in the room and then the buffer just kind of flew into the scanner. We've prepared a demonstration area at GE's MR Manufacturing Facility in Waukesha, Wisconsin. You will see some experiments and demonstrations which should never be attempted outside of this carefully controlled environment. The magnetic force on an object is a function of three factors. Its mass, its distance from the magnet, and how it's oriented to the field lines. What will be the force exerted on a two-pound pipe wrench? Securing one end of a line to the wrench and the other to a strain gauge and winch allows us to measure both the force and distance from the magnet bore. At a distance of two and a half feet, the gauge reads 3.7 pounds. Reduce that to two feet and the force rises to 10.8 pounds. Now as we get closer, the force will increase dramatically. This graph plots force against distance and shows that at close range, the magnetic force doubles or triples with just a few inches movement toward the magnet. And finally, at the magnet, this two-pound wrench is pulled with a force of more than 50 pounds. 
If the wrench should slip at this point, how fast would it fly into the magnet? For this experiment, we'll take a rubber ball filled with steel shot and toss it into the magnet. A radar gun will indicate the speed. In these tests, we measured speeds of 20 miles per hour or more. But more important is the rapid acceleration and unpredictable direction. The ball can take any number of routes as it flies into the magnet bore. Imagine the damage that could happen if this were a wrench, oxygen bottle, or other sharp or heavy object bouncing around like this. And what would be the impact of a wrench accelerating into the magnet as the pulling force reaches 50 pounds or more? These demonstrations, which should never be attempted by anyone outside of this controlled environment, show the overwhelming power of the MR system magnet and the sudden violence that can result from carelessness or lack of knowledge. Guard against mistakes in the magnet.
with these. Um, they also have the annual annuloplasty rings. This is what they look like, and the silicon catheters. So sometimes if you're if the patient needs a, a catheter placed in, and then they need to get imaged, um, silicon catheters are are, are MR safe. Um, and then you have these types of wires here um, that are basically you know just basically coils that fill aneurysms. Um, and they're, they're also MR safe. And same with um, some pacemakers are MR safe. Um, what is MR unsafe though are the temporary pacemakers. So anything that looks like, like this. Um, so it's good to check, you know. With pacemakers, I would always double check. Um, and then you have an implantable defibrillator. Um, this is inserted under the skin um, and basically measures the electrodes in the heart. Um, and so this one is, is MR unsafe. Then you have MR conditional. So this is like a gray zone, like conditional part because it depends on certain, obviously conditions. Uh, there's only certain conditions that you can use it under as, as it's implied in the name. So um, this is when an item that has been demonstrated to pose no known hazards in a specific MR environment with specified conditions to use. So the field conditions that define the MR environment include the static magnetic field strength, the spatial gradient time rate of change of the magnetic field and the RF fields and the specific absorption rate, absorption rate uh, which is SAR, um, which I'll talk a little bit about soon. Um, <clears throat> it basically has to do with the energy that's deposited into the tissue um, and the amount of heating that occurs. So uh, that's important to know. Um, um, and it's important to, you know, test um, these characteristics um, in an MR environment. So, you know, if you have to test them, there's certain things that you, that you need to test for, and that includes magnetically induced displacement force, um, the torque, so which I mentioned, and RF heating um, for patient safety. Other possible safety issues um, include, but not are not limited to, pretty much all of these things here. So, thermal injury, induced currents, voltages, um, electromagnetic compatibility. Uh, neurostimulation, acoustic noise, interaction among devices, the safe functioning of the item, and the safe operation of the MR system. Uh, so any parameter that affects the safety of the item should be listed. And any condition that is known to produce an unsafe condition uh, must be described. So examples of MR conditional devices are some types of, of heart valves, like IVC filters, devices that are partially ferromagnetic, and then the heart valve that's like sewn into the patient. So just some example of, you know, just to illustrate them, um, you have the diatonal vena cava filters, as I mentioned. Um, so, you know, these are sort of conditional, uh, can be placed in the, in a blood vessel. You have the loop recorder device over here. Uh, these are a little bit smaller, but again, uh, MR conditional. The ocular closure device, so the ASD device closure. Um, you know, they're kind of like a little plug. And then you also have another kind of stent. This is the aortic stent graft, um, you know, which is basically, this is a little bit different than the other stent I showed you, um, specifically for the aortic valve. So typically with MR conditional, you'll have this information on the, um, you know, that'll come with it. So. Um, this is what you know the the uh, the labeling information will look like, and these blanks will obviously uh, you you can fill them in for sure. Um, but you know, for example, um, if if you have a certain device that's sent to you, um, it'll come with this kind of label that says it can be scanned safely under the following conditions: static magnetic field of three tesla. Spatial gradient field of 720 gauss per centimeter or less. The maximum MR system reported the whole body average specific absorption rate of, of 2 watts per kilogram for 50 minutes of scanning. So it'll say things like that. So when you're trying to create a pulse sequence or modify an existing pulse sequence, this is important to know. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is there's an image artifact. So MR image quality may be compromised in the area of interest is in the same area or relatively close to the position of the device. Therefore, it may be necessary to optimize MR imaging parameters for the presence of this implant. So I actually have a talk on
really dedicated to um, image artifacts. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out. So more with MR conditional. Um, so for non-clinical testing, it has to demonstrate that the example implant is MR conditional. So I've kind of gone over this in the in the previous slide. Um, it'll, you know, it'll give you certain conditions that you need to meet, um, or certain thresholds that you, that you cannot uh, surpass. And and so this is very important to to read the the labeling. Um, so another source of like of safety issues, um, other than the main magnetic field, is the radio frequency pulses. So the the, the send receive pulses, but mostly the send ones. Like that's the one I'm talking about. Um, you know, we send in a pulse, and it creates um, it can create heating and tissue. We don't really care about the receive because that's what we use. You know, the signal we get is what we use to get an image. Um, so the RF pulse deposits energy in patients uh, to generate signal. Um, the more RF the more power. Uh, the FDA measures power through the specific absorption rate, uh, which I mentioned before, uh, due to concern of heating the patient, so like energy deposition. Um, so for example, if you're using a fast spin echo that uses a long train of 180 degree RF pulses, um, which are twice the amount of, of, of power as the 90 degree RF pulses, um, this, you know, your depositing more energy into the patient. So the patient may actually come out of the scanner feeling really warm. And that's be just because, you know, if he, um, you're depositing a lot of energy into, into the patient. Um, so the guidelines that the FDA has in place for the amount of power is uh, reasonable to deposit um, in patient over the time. So um, it's how much energy over time. Uh, all scanners are measure, measure power deposition, which is good. Um, so if you design your own pulse sequence or modify an existing sequence, the scanner computes it based on the weight of the patient. So if it exceeds the FDA guidelines, then you can't use it. Um, MR is the opposite of microwave. So in MR, the patient is heated on the surface. Microwaves, microwave heats from the inside out. Um, the scanner measures power deposition, but be aware of how it applies to uh, the tissue surface. So the scanner will estimate energy deposition for tissue. It won't account for any metal in the patient, so like head staples, which is much more efficient at absorbing the RF energy. So for example, an aneurysm clip deep within the tissue won't have the same impact as if it were on the surface. Um, another example is plates in the femur that will heat up. So the femur is a lot smaller, but um, it's good to take into account the depth of, of, of these plates. Um, and then there's metal, metal on the surface that isn't ferromagnetic, like tattoos, um, orthodontic work, and makeup, um, etc. So these can cause heating. There's also heat dissipation, which is something that's good to be aware of. So, for example, like if you're imaging and uh, doing heart imaging, and there's an intravascular stent um, that's made up of like a super metal, but not ferromagnetic, um, it will heat up. But because there's constant flow of the blood. Um, that heat that it generates will be dissipated, you know, pretty quickly um, because the blood is just constantly flowing. So if you heat up that blood, the, the blood that's right next to it at a certain time point, you know, a few seconds later, it's long gone. Um, and then you can also do a risk benefit assessment. So if you can't wait to resolve the issue, um, one, it's good to make the patient aware of the situation, provided that they can communicate. And um, you know, if, if they have something like a tattoo or something on their on the surface, you can use a heat sink uh, to put over that metal area. Um, so, like an ice pack, a towel soaked in cold water, something like that, because we know that most of the heating comes on the surface. So, if you want to put something over it, um, then it creates a, a layer of thickness um, on top of the metallic surface. Then there's also gradients. So we talked about main magnetic field, RF pulse, and now there's gradients. So gradients are conceptually similar to RF when it comes to energy deposition, but the amplitude of the magnetic field is less and the duration is much less. So the total amount of power deposited is not directly an issue of, of tissue heating. For example, the metallic material efficiently absorbs energy. Um, so the issue with the gra gradient fields is due to very rapid switching of gradient magnetic field over time. So, you know, if you induce an M uh, current and voltage in conductive material, um, this will always heat the tissue. So for example, at 3T, when you're using an echo planar imaging method, um, 
switching extremely rapidly and peripheral nerves are being stimulated so the patient is lying in the scanner um, it, they're twitching due to the electric shock that's running down their skin um, so this is like specifically for an echo planar imaging at 3T um, so the FDA doesn't consider this to be a major problem um, the threshold is basically when the patient tells you that it's too painful and I mean this is you know you place the patient in the scanner and you give them um, you know, something where they can actually alert the nurse if they're feeling uncomfortable. Uh, most of the time you put them in the scanner and they're feeling claustrophobic. So that's usually when they uh, they ring for the, the technologist. But, you know, sometimes uh, if, if they feel some pain or discomfort, they will ring for them as well. Um, so what if you have conductive material? Like for example, um, a pacemaker that's composed of pieces of ele electronics that cause electrical pulses. So wires that go from the chest wall into the heart, um, or the gradient magnetic field that interacts with electronics um, that cause it to function abnormally. Um, and then there's the gradient mag magnetic fields that can interact directly, you know, with the le the electrode itself. Um, there was an a, uh, an experiment that was done with dogs um, who had pacemakers. Um, their hearts were able to be paced by the gradient magnetic field. Um, so switching. Uh, this, it was the switching of the gradient magnetic field induced voltage in the conductor that caused enough um, of an impulse to pace the cardiac cycle. So you can't just turn off the pacemaker. Uh, they discharge at points in the cardiac cycle when they are not supposed to. Um, so the acoustic noise is loud with gradient echo uh, to give them the hearing protection. Um, so just to uh, kind of drive home the point of RF coils, um, you know, they have cables that connect to the scanner. Um, they're used, you know, gating wires for cardiac studies, for example. Um, they can monitor leads on the patient. So all of these can potentially burn the patient. And, you know, with wires, it's something you have to be important, uh, that you have to take into consideration. Um, so make sure wire the wires um, do not overlap, or sorry, make sure the wire is not in a loop and always as straight as possible. And then keep wires at the center of the bore and not touching the side of the bore. Um, the RF is a mag field that deposits energy. Uh, the farther we are away from the source of the magnetic field, the less magnitude of the induced current. And also keep the wires insulated. So um, there needs to be sheets, sponges, blankets, etc., as you never want to have a wire laid up against the patient's skin. This is an example of a, like a cable burn. Um, so this patient will have that probably for life after that. So you wanna be very careful with the wires. And the American College of Radiology has come up with a few safety zones. Um, so there's zones one through four, um, and they correspond to the levels of increased magnetic field exposure, um, and hence potential safety concerns. So, you know, zone one, which is out here, um, is, is all areas are freely accessible to the general public without supervision. So the magnetic fields in this area are less than five gauss, so less than 0 0.5 millitesla. Um, in zone two, uh, this is still a public area, but the interface between unregulated zone one and the strictly controlled zones three and four, um, it's sort of the interface between the two. So the MR safety screening typically occurs uh, here with the technologists. Um, you have undressing and everything here. And then there's zone three. Um, it's an area near the magnet, magnet room where the fringe gradient or RF magnetic fields are sufficiently strong to present a physical hazard to unscreened patients and personnel. So that's the control room here, um, the computer room essentially. And then you have zone four, which is where the magnet is. So it's synonymous with the MR magnet room itself. It has the highest uh, field and greatest risk and from which all ferromagnetic objects must be excluded. Um, so just um, some important points, um, you know, the hazards that are associated with RF fields. So the most important hazard um, is burning tissue. Uh, so this is why um, this is why my whole talk was on you know not uh, it was on the different ways that tissue can burn um, and why we have to be careful about implanted devices. Um, so direct tissue heating will lead to burn burns. Uh, the FDA has issued a specific absorption ratio, which I talked about a little bit. So the SAR, it's a pr parameter of heating. It establishes allowable RF energy deposition, and the units are in watts per kilogram. So the SAR limit is basically four watts per kilogram in 15 minutes for the whole body, uh, three watts per kilogram in 10 minutes for the head, eight watts per kilogram for any gram of tissue in the head or torso, and 12 watts per kilogram in five minutes for the extremities. 
types of uh, posters that the FTA will put out. Um, so you have like the MRI burn prevention. Um, you can supplement that with this talk for sure. And then you have understanding MRI safety labeling. Um, and I've gone through these labels before, so you will be able to know, you know, what they look like. Um, and you'll be able, after this talk, you should be able to know a lot of what they're talking about in, in these posters here. Um, so thank you very much for watching. Um, if you, you know, if you like my videos, please subscribe. Um, I'm going to put out more videos, um, one more on the MR topic for sure. And I'm going to start doing a few more on CT and X-ray. So thanks again for watching. Uh, please subscribe to my channel and I'll see you soon. Thank you.